Okay, so we're gonna get we're gonna get this thing charged up. And Governor, thank you for kicking this off for us. That is a it's a huge deal for number one for our state to just hear that commitment come out. Um, to hear President Lowe and hear the commitment throughout the state level is a very very big deal. So what I wanted to do today was take you through and have a conversation. Car, I need you up there to click for me if you could. Is I'm gonna do four things today. I want to give you a little bit of a history of the Cupid's Cup. I want to give you a brief story of just Under Armour, where we came from, and remind you that it doesn't always, it's not always easy, and it's like that for everybody. So the same things that you're feeling in the audience, the same things that you're feeling in your companies right now, the same things that we felt at Under Armour, not 20 years ago or 15 years ago, but as recent as seven and eight years ago. I want to tell you what's happening with entrepreneurship briefly, and then I'd just like very close is to leave you with a couple of the ideas of the philosophy, the ethos that we use to drive at Under Armour. So if I could, let me jump and just give you a bit of history and start with my days back here at the University of Maryland College Park. Entrepreneurship, it begins at the University of Maryland, and it began here for me as well. What you see behind me is the first flyer that I put up at the University of Maryland when I started this business called Cupid's Valentine Rose Delivery. And looking back on it and pulling this flyer up the other day so I could have it for this presentation, I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I charge $25 versus just $23? <laughs> if they're going to pay $23, they are going to pay $25. I would have started right there with any of the advisors in the Dingman Center. So you find out where the name comes from. Why is it Cupid's Cup? And it's something that's very personal to me because it's a very personal story. And more importantly, it's a story that is just real. So when you look and think about what it was in the rose business for me, I started my freshman year and I set out and said, you know, a college kid can't afford to spend $70 or $80 on a dozen flowers for their sweetheart. So why not call a uh, wholesaler, buy some boxes, put them together, hire an artist to do this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that you'd slap, put these flyers all over campus. And from that I set out very simply. I was going to sell a hundred dozen flowers, gross 23, not $2,500. And in doing that, um, we sold them my first year. We sold all 100 dozen. They were pre-ordered, they sold, and it was great. And as an athlete here, again, you weren't allowed to get a job. As a student athlete, it wasn't permissible, but nobody said anything about not having the ability to start a company. So in doing that, Cupid's Valentine was born. I went from 100 dozen my freshman year to 250 dozen my sophomore year, 1100 or 650 dozen my junior year to 1186 dozen flowers sold my senior year. And the only reason I remember that number is because I tried selling 1500 and I watched 314 dozen die on me. <laughs> Couple lessons learned from this experience. Number one, never deal in inventory that can die. It doesn't look good for anybody. We had the, a grocery business in here before. I am scared to death of it. And number two, make sure that anybody that you work with can count to 12. <laughs> Very simple philosophies that you have. Or find out that the word dozen is different in Spanish than in English. This is a circa 1994 photo of some of my helpers. These guys worked at a bar with me, and they helped me assemble the flowers one year. It was a... a experience of one that I learned a couple things from getting in the flower business. And looking back at these old pictures, it drums it up. It was just finding out if I could create an idea that people wanted to pave money for. And not in some capitalistic, you know, angry, how do we profit, but more importantly, how do we put people together? How do we get them to focus and to hone on a singular vision? And frankly, I realized I was pretty good at doing that. And that it was a powerful and more importantly, an empowering thing. Education at the University of Maryland is much more than just what you learn in the classroom. And I encourage any of the students here, all the entrepreneurs here, take advantage of that in each and every way that you can. So in doing that, my ultimately netted and net-net through this process, I was able to establish some pretty good credit. I built up about $40,000 in credit cards, over five different credit cards that I had. I had about $15,000 in cash. So coming out of school, I figured I had this idea for this stretchy t-shirt. Why not give it a shot? I'm 22, 23 years old, and said, there has to be a better idea. So as a football player, I just never liked the way my cotton t-shirt felt beneath my equipment. Why doesn't someone make a better alternative? You wear a short sleeve cotton t-shirt in the summer and a long sleeve cotton t-shirt in the winter. It wasn't rocket science but no one had addressed what an athlete wears beneath their equipment. The focus was on keeping another ounce out of the shoe or the technical benefits of what could happen by lightening a helmet or another piece of equipment. Nobody thought about the apparel. And we took the word apparel and frankly we turned it into equipment. So in doing that, we started the company. I figured I had enough to get going. 
So getting out of Maryland, I set up shop in a Georgetown row house that my mother was nice enough to let me live in, kind of rent free, sort of, but it was a place where I was living on the ground floor, uh, living on the upstairs, keeping sales office on the ground floor, which is the photo you see behind me, and keeping my inventory in the basement of this house. I used my friends, I used the network. You have a network now that you don't even recognize. And it was the guys that I played with at Maryland. It was the prep school, Fork Union where I went to. St. John's College High School down in Washington, DC. And all those different stops where I met all these different athletes that I encouraged and I brought them in to come be a part and help me to get them behind this singular vision. And they all came on. Because I wasn't asking for money, I wasn't pushing them and being, especially the ones that had gone on. They were playing at other schools, the ones that had gone on to the NFL. And it wasn't me calling like an obnoxious third cousin saying, can you loan me $500? You're making all this money now. It was me simply saying, hey, I've got an idea. Let me send you a shirt. And if you like it, give one to the guy in the locker next to you. Very quickly from those early tests that I had in this business, it grew from a couple of football players to then all of a sudden a few baseball players on campus in the spring of 1996. And then a few lacrosse players started wearing the product. And then the girlfriends of the lacrosse players started wearing the product. And I knew right then and there that not only did we have a product, but there was this whole new category, this category of performance that no one had touched. Why wasn't anyone doing anything about it? And as I asked and I sought advice, it was hard finding people that could buy into what that vision was or what it wanted to be. I was lucky enough to not listen to people. I was lucky enough to use this statement that I framed my thinking back then, and hopefully still today. I was always smart enough to be naive enough to not know what we could not accomplish. I was always smart enough to be naive enough to not know what we could not accomplish. Why not us? Because anybody smart I talked to said, are you crazy? You're gonna go against these behemoths in this industry? You know how big these other brands are, the guys out west, the guys in Germany? It's a dangerous category. The fact is I didn't care. All I knew was that I was gonna make the world's greatest t-shirt. And it started out making the world's greatest t-shirt for football players that quickly grew to baseball players, lacrosse players, hockey players, on and on and on. Great product always wins, and we are fortunate to have that. So from that spring of 96, every day got better than the last. It was never about completely finding it. Those timelines from 96 as we grew and we moved on, we continued to push. We moved through the ideas of things of thinking about having progress over perfection. You're entrepreneurs. The hardest thing that you're going to deal with is that your product isn't everything that you envision it to be. The ability to print and publish every day, to keep moving no matter what, because there's a lot of reasons not to. There's people, and if you listen or watch the talking head shows on, on the financial networks, you'll hear every reason why the economy's here, the economy's there. You can't, you can't, you can't. Find a way. Find a way and get out of your attic, get out of your basement, Take the idea and push. So through all that great product, big picture, we had growth. And as Under Armour grew, we were lucky. From that first year in 1996, we did $17,000 in revenues. The next year, we did 110,000 to 400,000, million three, five million, 20 million, 50 million, 115, 205, 285, 404, 605, 756, 860, 1047, this past year we did $1.47 billion in revenues with a commitment will grow another 20 plus percent again this year. Only in America, we will keep growing. And our commitment where it took 15 years for us to reach our first billion dollars, our commitment to Wall Street in 2010 when we crossed that milestone was that we would do and cross our second billion by 2013. Within 15 to the first billion, three years to the second billion. That is what we want to happen, and that, frankly, is the opportunity that you have. So how are we built today? We're publicly listed on the big board, the New York Stock Exchange, as ticker symbol UA, nearly 5,000 employees, offices all over the world, with our headquarters right here in Maryland, right here in Baltimore on the waterfront, the beautiful waterfront, less than a mile from Fort McHenry, governor's old city. Still your current city, though, too, isn't it, Governor? And more importantly, we're building something special. Not only are we have offices, we're going to make our area better. The 1,300 people that we have at headquarters, they have this belief. They have this idea that we can be next. We continue to carry that mantra of being smart enough to be naive enough, of saying, why not us? 
Why can't we be the next great brand, and why shouldn't that brand, that brand founded on performance, on innovation, it should come from right here. So Under Armour is a product company. It's a fact. But we're using product to leverage a much larger platform. We want to be a platform company. So today, we've done that. We've made some pretty good products, and we've had some pretty good success. But what do we want to look like in the future? What does our company want to be? And more importantly, what will take us there? You hear the word a lot today, but it's important that it comes out because the way that we drive at Under Armour, first and foremost, we are an innovation company. We are a product innovation engine, and we'll continue to drive that. And the mantra that we keep on every one of our product teams, when we announce them, they say they're going to design a new season, is this idea that we have not yet built our defining product as a brand. That mentality rings true. Our goal isn't to be known as, oh yeah, the, the, the company with the stretchy t-shirts. We don't just make t-shirts. We make apparel, we make footwear, we make bags. We have a new product called the E39, which is the most technical t-shirt that's ever been in the market. Measuring beyond just that t-shirt of deciding that the size of the sweat stain on my gray t-shirt is gonna tell me when I've had a good workout. But actually turning it into hard data of how we measure our performance. When I think about innovation, I think about leverage, I think about the idea that Under Armour can be as a platform company. And I want to give you a couple of stories. About two years ago, I went out to the Consumer Electronics Show. They call it CES. It's in Las Vegas. And it's huge. It occupies every square inch of Las Vegas convention space. And I remember walking around that space, and the thing that blew me away was, you know, that I'm at CES. This is the epicenter of innovation and technology. What's next? And frankly, there was not like one or two really great ideas. There was one idea. It was this idea of super flat or thin televisions. And I'm thinking to myself, don't we already have flat televisions? They do, but those are like four inches thick. These are now like two inches thick. And then the really innovative ones had like an inch and three quarters. And if you were really pushing it, you're going from an inch and three quarters to an inch and a half. And I'm thinking, all the convention space in Las Vegas focused on flat screen TVs, and there are other ideas there, but this was the one. And I'm going, the best idea everybody can come back with? From Sony, Panasonic, LG, Motorola, you name the brands, was making a television a little bit thinner. And I'm thinking within those companies that I just mentioned, how many engineers work there? 10, 20, 40, 50,000? focused on everybody racing for that next piece. And it's going, why is that space so crowded? A provocative idea that I had. Oh, Kev, you make sporting goods. How hard is that? It's t-shirts, it's shoes, it's these other things. What if the idea that we had said, how can we leverage the brand that we are? What if I took just one function from Panasonic and I took all their smart engineers and I challenged, I've got them in a car and we took 10,000 engineers to Dick Sporting Goods. And I asked everybody to get out and walk through Dick's Sporting Goods. And I asked teams of 100 to grab a product and start innovating. One group grabs a baseball bat. Another group grabs a shoe. Another group grabs a shirt and how we can make this thing electronic. Another group grabs a helmet and says, how can we keep our kids safer on the football field? That type of thinking hasn't been in place until now. That is the way Under Armour wants to leverage ourselves. So we're thinking about this in two parts. We're thinking, number one, how can we drive and how can we build this ourselves internally? And we're mandating things like, and I, I talked to Daryl earlier, I said, hire 20 engineers. We want to hire 20 engineers and put them on our innovation team working with Kevin Haley and our team this year. Get them on board. Get them in the, get them in the picture. We're not just people dying and making shirts. And what makes them cool is the, the color or the design that makes into them. It's what makes the shirts whole is what is real. So you think about where Under Armour is based. We're in Baltimore, Maryland. We're less than 30 miles here from campus. We're less than 40 miles from some of the brands that you'll see pop up now. The Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Columbia. Thousands of scientists and engineers. The NSA, DARPA, as well as one very special partner that we're extremely excited about a recent partnership that we've made. Partnerships with great companies like another based, Maryland-based innovator like Lockheed Martin. 120 plus thousand employees, 75,000 plus engineers. 
We are currently working with Lockheed, collaborating on some of the most advanced technologies imaginable, leveraging their technical leadership with our sports leadership. More to come in the future on that. But what I'll tell you, when I bring up networks, I bring up the people I went to school with, how we leverage these other pieces. Interesting enough, the president of Lockheed Martin happens to be a Maryland grad as well, Chris Kubasic, which you could say had something to do with this partnership, although it's for the benefit of both of us. Go Terps. So innovation is, of course, cool, but there's other things going on in the world. I was recently at a technology summit, and it was a, a CEO summit, it was a thought leadership thing, and uh, one of my partners, one of my board members, Bill McDermott, who's the co-CEO of SAP, and they had this event, probably 40 CEOs, maybe 30 of which were from outside the United States, so a very global thinking, and SAP is a 20 plus billion dollar German-based software company, and in being there, it was interesting to take away. It was a, a day of, of fascinating conversation with professors from the best universities and the finest thinking of what they came out with. And I remember the summary that they had at the end of this long presentation. There were two major themes that they drove home because they had experts on social media, experts on how kids are texting and communicating today, which is different than before. So the first thing they came away, which was with no surprise, that technology can make us better. Better phones. They called the the iPhone, they called it the, the modern genie in the bottle of today, and you rub it and things come out and it gives you information, it's fascinating. The second thing is what really kind of caught me off guard, is the challenge that they laid out, is they said first technology will make us better, and the second thing he said, when the CEOs summed it up, was that they challenged business leaders to make unemployment go away. Think about this. Think about the issue that we have now. Think about the conversations that everyone, from President Lowe to the governor, have been talking about, of the issues that we face, not only as Marylanders, but as Americans, but more importantly, as a global society. There was not a CEO, I can tell you, in that room who was thinking about, my gosh, how do I hire more people next year? What am I doing to make this happen? And you want to put some context to it? Take a look at where unemployment is. It's at 9% in the United States today. Do some simple math on the tens of millions of Americans out of work. And then look at that ad idea and look at that stat globally. Spain has 20 plus percent unemployment. This is an issue that we, we are going to make, need to take a look at. So what do we do about it? Exactly what we're doing today. Exactly the reason that you're here. Because the fact is when you graduate from school, that job may not be there. So what are you going to do? There's an answer, and it rests in yourself. It rests in the conviction, and more importantly, the courage to take a chance and to start that business. Not nearly enough, not nearly enough are we trying. Entrepreneurship can fix the problem that isn't just a Maryland or a US problem, but it's happening all over the world. Let me give you a couple stats. How do we value a job today? In the 1970s, the most valuable company in the world was General Motors, with a market cap of just around $60 billion. At $60 billion of market cap, they had 900,000 Americans employed, not to mention what they pulled around the globe. That comes out to a dollar value of about $66,000 per employee by market capitalization. So how are the markets valuing companies today? Take a look at what I was at another conference one time, and I heard this term, it's called the Four Horsemen. The four horsemen of Silicon Valley, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple. These four collective companies, as you look at them, Amazon has, what is it, roughly 40-some thousand, sorry, 56,000, Google 32,000, Facebook about 3,000-ish, Apple about 60,000 Americans employed. The combined market cap of that total is 100, roughly 151,000 employees. The combined market cap of those four companies is nearly a trillion dollars. In the 1970s, the most valuable company in the world was worth $60 billion and employed 900,000 Americans. Today, those four are bigger than anything. They have a trillion dollars of market cap and they only employ 150,000 of us. What are you gonna do about it? More importantly, what are we gonna do about it? If you look at that on a per capita basis, that number today is valued at $6.6 .6 million per employee. 
Think about how that's changed. Think about the value of a job. So what is the answer? Is there an answer? I say it again. It's sitting right in this room, and it's within that idea that like, yeah, Kev, I don't know, am I ready or not? Entrepreneurship's the answer. The idea by the White House to put together the Startup America Initiative is just one of the steps. It doesn't work unless it happens. And this isn't something that we're doing just for stats. This is something that we're doing for ourselves, we're doing for our kids, and frankly, we're doing for our kids' kids. Because that issue of 20 plus percent employment in some European countries, 9% here, as you can see, it's not going away because markets are not valuing companies that are saying, we're gonna hire 20% more people next year. Because technology is moving so fast, we are getting that much more efficient. So as I bring you down with that, I tell you that it ain't over. There's companies that are hiring, there's companies that are growing, and that is your job to step up and pick up the ball. So what I'd like to do is tell you some of the things of the way that we think about, the way that we run our company. I call it our philosophy, our ethos. I call it, frankly, my whiteboards. I run our company like a team, sales and marketing like offense, manufacturing distribution like defense, finance IT like special teams. And what I found as I've grown, it's not about like an American football team, where it's, there's the offense and then there's the defense. We're like a European football team. Everybody's on the field at the same time. And the companies who win are the companies who flat out will communicate the best. In there on these whiteboards, I keep these themes. If you listened to me earlier, you heard some of them. Overpromise and deliver. Walk with a purpose. Listen more than you talk. Dictate the tempo. No loser talk. That's right, you hear that? Like, get depressed. Get up and do something about it. People are. Because what I deal with every day is people look at me and they go, Kevin, huh, you did, like, how the, that football player from Maryland, really? I just kind of like that. And my action is, yeah, you mean some football player from Maryland can do it? You can do it too. And that is a special message. That's a powerful message and one, frankly, that we encourage. So I want to talk to you just about a couple of the ideas of the ethos that we run our company by. First is something that sits at the center of my whiteboards. I call them my pillars of greatness. And if you've been to Cupid's Cup before, you've heard these. And if you come for the next five years, you're going to hear them again. I call my job description. This is what we do. There's four things. We are first and foremost a product company. It's about having the best product, but probably one of the best products that we make and that we build is our ability to be great storytellers. We pride ourselves because unless the product gets to market, the most expensive thing in any retail store is an empty fixture. And we call it service. And we call it service with a smile. And we call it over delivering. And fourth and probably, not probably, but definitely most importantly, is team. Building a great team. We all hold ourselves accountable to what that means. So another thing where this sits at the center of my whiteboard, there's one thing, and my whiteboards are all written in black, except for I've got one phrase that's actually written in red ink. It sits at the top of my whiteboard, and it says the following. Don't forget to sell shirts and shoes. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? A lot of people in the world have no idea what their shirts and shoes are. And frankly, either did I. It took me a long time to figure that out. I'll give you our vision statement. I'll tell you our mission statement. Empower athletes everywhere. Make all athletes better through passion, design, the relentless pursuit of innovation. We do a lot of cool stuff. We outfit a lot of different athletes, a lot of different events. We go all over the place. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember where we monetize, where we ring the register, where we can give the greatest gift back to the University of Maryland, to the state of Maryland, to especially our own team of people at Under Armour, is ensuring that each and every day that we stay in business that we're the best at what we do, that we're faster than anybody else. And the way we do that today is by making the world's most innovative and thought-provoking apparel and footwear that the world has ever seen. I like to equate it to a, it's great, you go to one of these theme parks and you get on a, a ride in the Incredible Hulk ride, and it's this great thrilling thing, it's exciting, it's fun, everything else. You get off the ride, and then what do they do? They put you through the turnstile, you walk in the gift shop, somebody stands there and says, you sure you don't want a mug? If it was an Under Armour person, they'd say something like, you sure you don't want a shirt or a shoe? because we are gonna bring you on and make you fall in love. When we make a baked bag, it's because we want someone to say, you know, I tried an Under Armour bag, it was the greatest bag I ever had, I wonder what their shirts and shoes are like. I always give that advice first and foremost, I talk to entrepreneurs about it, but I talk to college seniors about it. I talk to high school seniors, geez, where am I gonna go to school, what am I gonna do? 
oh my gosh, I don't know which job should I take, company A, company B, company C. And the idea about what that means and what more importantly what that feels, get off the fence. Commit. Pick your poison. Decide what you're going to do. And if you're in it, get in it. And if you're working at company A, don't spend your whole time figuring out, my gosh, I don't know if I should be here or not. Pour everything you have into it. And if you make a different decision, then make it full speed and move on and never look back. I couldn't give you any better advice today than A, figure out what your shirts and shoes are and commit. Whether that's business, whether that's personal, you have to figure that out for yourself. Next, I want to tell you about leadership. And everybody, you see books on leadership, but it has their own definition. I have my own. The way that I think about what I look for in people when I bring them on our team. Leaders, first and foremost, they solve problems. Like if I had a business card and just said a generic business card that I want any employee in Under Armour, any teammate in Under Armour to be able to walk around with, it would just say problem solver. I call leaders operators. They're the ones that you can put in and say, I don't care if they're an apparel person, a footwear person, a human resources person, they're just leaders. And what do leaders look like? First and foremost, leaders always have a herd. People always like following leaders. Maybe it's their charisma, maybe it's their personality, maybe it's because they're so in belief of what they say that you have the ability to convince people to buy into your vision, not just for a paycheck. It's something more than that. Because great leaders, they don't only really have a herd, they fight for their herd, and the herd knows that. That's your job as entrepreneurs. These are not employees that do your bidding. These are partners that you should bring into your space. And you should be treated like that. And they should be treated like that, with respect and with dignity. Because it's not an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial person. It's an entrepreneurial company. And that's a culture that you must espouse. And it doesn't just live with you. It should live with everybody the same way it lives throughout the halls at Under Armour. Great leaders always have a point of view. They know what they're doing. And they might be wrong. But they're going to run like hell in one direction as fast and as hard as they can. And if they figure it out they went in the wrong direction, then they'll make a different decision. Great leaders always have intellectual curiosity. Man, this is like one of the most important things. They're the kind of people that say things like, why? Why do we wear, why do we, why do you wear a sweaty t-shirt underneath your pads? Doesn't it get like really heavy? And shouldn't somebody do something about it? This wasn't rocket science. Why did anybody else figure this out? No matter what it is, Ask why, figure out, solve problems. Last and most importantly about leadership, leaders always believe. They always have a passion for what they do. They fundamentally feel it in their bones that something great is going to happen. And it may work, it may work out, it may get in trouble, something good, something bad. But they believe that at the end of the day, tomorrow is going to be just a little bit better than today. And I'm not telling you because when people ask me and say, did you know, did you have an idea how big Under Armour or what it could be? I had no idea. I just got up every morning and I didn't say, oh, geez, can it happen or not? I got up every morning. I said, I know it, there's no chance that it couldn't happen. Why couldn't it be me? Why couldn't it be us? We run like that. We operate like that every day. Two quick ones I want to leave you with, and then I think we want to do a question or two. This is about the new golden rule. The old golden rule was written by a pretty smart guy. And he said, do unto others as you'd have them do unto yourself. This worked when everybody in the world looked the same, or the people that were talking or used it looked the same. Now we all look different. Different heights, different colors, different countries, different languages. The new golden rule, and this actually came from Bob McDonald, the chairman of Procter & Gamble. And Bob said, the new golden rule is to do unto others as they want to be treated, not as you want to treat them. Think about that. Think about that, your customer. Think about how you listen and how you bring that on. Last and finally, my comments for you is first and foremost, to avoid the loser talk is to find ways to get things done, done, done. Because there's a difference. I like to say that employees get things done Partners get things done, done, and owners get things done, done, done. We want owners at Under Armour. You want owners in your businesses. You don't want somebody that says, hey, yeah, uh, did, you get that, um, did you get that release done? Is that new brochure done? They'll say, yeah, yeah, I got it done. And then you say, no, 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 no. Did you get it done? Well, yeah, 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 I got it done. I said, no, no, no. Did you get it done, done, done? There's a difference. There's an expectation. 
And more importantly, there's a culture that goes with that. All the way through the line, find a way. Ladies and gentlemen, we're done, done, done. Thank you very much.